Section 8 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. Chapter 8 The Democracy of Abraham Lincoln. Part 1. The Democracy of Abraham Lincoln. Footnote. Addressed to the Students of Boston University School of Law, March 14, 1913. In his History of Twenty-Five Years, Sir Spencer Walpole says, Yet perhaps of all the men born to the Anglo-Saxon race in the nineteenth century, Mr. Lincoln deserves the highest place in history. No man ever rose more quickly to the dignity of a great position. No man ever displayed more moderation in council, or more resolution in administration, or held a calmer or steadier course. Through the channel of difficulty and danger he kept his rudder true. This is high praise, but I think that we may go a step further. As the nineteenth century recedes into the past, it becomes constantly more apparent that the three great events of that period, the three great facts with a supreme influence upon Western civilization and upon the world, were the preservation of the American Union, the consolidation of Germany, and the unification of Italy. With these three events, the names of three men are indissolubly associated, Lincoln, Cavour, and Bismarck they stand forth as embodying the cause of national unity in the united states in italy and in germany they were the leaders the directing minds in the mighty conflicts which produced the great results and they loom ever larger and more distinct as the years pass by like high mountain peaks which at a distance separate themselves from the confused masses of the range from which they rise I have mentioned these three commanding figures in the order in which, as it seems to me, they stand, and as I think they will stand when the final account is made up. But comparisons are needless. The greatness of Abraham Lincoln is admitted by the world, and his place in history is assured. Yet to us he has a significance and an importance which he cannot have to other people. It is impossible to translate a beautiful poem without losing in some degree the ineffable quality, the final perfection which it possesses in the language in which it was written. In its native speech, the verse is wedded to the form and the words and has tone in its voice which only those who are to the manner born can hear. So Lincoln, whose life rightly considered was a poem, speaks to his own people as he does to no other. What he was, and what he did and said, is all part of our national life and of our thoughts as well. We see in him the man who led in the battle which resulted in a united country, and which we have watched his crescent fame as it has mounted ever higher with the incessant examination of his life and character. No record has ever leaped to light by which he could be shamed. Apart from all comparisons, it is at least certain that he is the greatest figure yet produced by modern democracy, which began its onward march at the little bridge in Concord. If ever a man lived who understood and loved the people to whom he gave his life, Lincoln was that man. In him no one has a monopoly. He is not now the property of any sect or any party. His fame is the heritage of the people of the United States, and, as Stanton said, standing by his deathbed, he belongs to the ages. For all these reasons, it seems to me, in these days of agitation and disquiet, when the fundamental principles upon which our government rests, and has always rested, are assailed, that nothing could be more profitable and more enlightening than to know just what Lincoln's opinions were as to democracy, and the true principles of free government. I am well aware that objection may be made to Lincoln as an authority for our guidance, of the same character as the one brought against the framers of the Constitution, which is that he died nearly half a century ago, and that, therefore, however excellent he was in his own day and generation, he is now out of date as a guide in public questions, because all conditions have so completely changed. 
it is quite true that lincoln like washington never saw a telephone an automobile or a flying machine and that economic conditions as well as those of business and finance have been radically altered but this is really an inept objection because the subject upon which we seek to know his thoughts concerns the relation of human nature to certain forms and principles of government among men most of which were as familiar to the speculations of plato and aristotle as they are to us some of which are older than recorded history while the very youngest have been known discussed and experimented with for centuries so i think we may dismiss the suggestion that lincoln is antiquated and realize that upon the principles of free government and the capabilities of human beings in that direction he is an authority as, as ancient as the greek philosophers and as modern as the last young orator who has just discovered that this very comparative world is not abstractly and ideally perfect what then were the thoughts and opinions of abraham lincoln as to the principles upon which free and ordered popular government should rest he alone can tell us no one is vested with the authority to proclaim to us what lincoln thought or believed upon any subject there is no high priest at that altar to utter oracles which no one else can question and which he alone can interpret lincoln's convictions and opinions are to be found in only one place in his own speeches and writings which like his fame belong to his countrymen and to mankind fortunately we need not grope about to discover his meaning few men who have ever lived and played a commanding part in the world have had the power of expressing their thoughts with greater clearness or in a style more pellucid and direct than lincoln of him it may be truly said that his statements are demonstrations you will search far before you will find a man who could state a proposition more irresistibly leaving no avenue of escape or could use a more relentless logic than the president of the civil war we feel as we read his life that he had in him the nature of a poet the imagination which pertains to the poetic nature and which was manifested not only in what he said and did but in his intuitive sympathy with all sorts and conditions of men combined with these attributes of the poetic genius which are as rare as it is impalpable were qualities seldom found in that connection he was an able lawyer and had the intellectual methods of the trained legal mind he was also the practical man of affairs as well as the great statesman looking at facts with undazzled eyes and moulding men and events to suit his purpose there is no occasion for guesswork or assertion or speculation in regard to him when he turned away from the visions of the imagination to confront and deal with the hard problems of life and government never to any man harder than they were to him let us then examine his writings and speeches and see what light they throw upon the questions now subject to public discussion which relate to the constitution of the united states and to the principles upon which that great instrument was based let me remind you on the outset that i am going to deal only with the fundamental principles of government embodied in the constitution and not at all with the many provisions which simply establish the machinery or mechanism of government it is important to keep this distinction in mind for it is frequently lost sight of and the ensuing confusion is deleterious to intelligent comprehension the mechanism of government may be very important and a change in it may be either beneficent or unfortunate but it is not vital whereas if the fundamental principles are altered weakened or abandoned the whole structure will come crashing to the ground for example to change the method of electing senators may be harmful or beneficial but it is only a change of mechanism but to abandon the equal representation of the states in the senate is a vital and destructive change of principle for the extinction of the states would mean the extinction of our governmental system and would involve in its ruin the basic principle of local self-government the number of judges in the supreme court is a matter of machinery and expediency but the appointment and tenure of those judges embody principles which go to the very root of all ordered and stable government 
it is on questions of principle alone that i would seek to learn the opinions of lincoln and before entering upon that inquiry let me define the questions upon which it seems to me well that we should seek his guidance at this time they are two in number representative government as involved in the agitation in favor of the compulsory initiative and referendum and the independence of the courts which is at stake in the demand for the recall of judges and the review of judicial decisions by popular vote and in an attempt to set forth lincoln's opinions upon these questions it would be impossible to consider the arguments for or against these two propositions for each one by itself requires a discussion of great length and elaboration i shall make no effort to show that the compulsory initiative and referendum so loudly demanded in the name of the people is in essence a plan to secure not the rule of the people but arbitrary government by small highly organized and irresponsible minorities of voters nor shall i try to show that the judicial recall and the review of judicial decisions by popular vote would not only like the compulsory initiative and referendum establish the power of highly organized minorities among the voters but would also give us servile and subservient courts controlled by an outside force and therefore incapable of honestly interpreting the law and doing justice between man and man i will however pause long enough to point out that both schemes lead consciously or unconsciously to the same result if successful they would bring us to a government composed of the executive and the voters it is inevitable that this should be the case for if you reduce to impotency the representative and judicial branches of the government nothing remains but the executive and the voters the last conspicuous example of this kind of government was the second empire in france by a vote of over seven millions to two hundred and fifty thousand napoleon was made emperor on may eighth eighteen seventy his constitutional changes continuing the empire on a more liberal basis were sustained by a vote of over seven millions to a million and a half and within six months after this immense expression of popular approval his empire had crumbled into ruins and he was himself a prisoner in germany the result of this form of direct democracy was not happy in that instance at least and at bottom the question is between direct democracy on the one hand and self-limited democracy on the other the first is very old the second very new dating on a large scale at least only from our own constitution of seventeen eighty seven which lord acton speaks of as an achievement in the way of self-limitation which man had up to that time regarded as impossible i have no intention of discussing the merits or demerits of the two systems but the fact that direct democracy is old and our self-limited democracy is new must not be forgotten when it is proposed to emasculate representative government as was done by the third napoleon or to take from the courts their independence it may be a change for the better as its advocates contend because almost anything human is within the bounds of possibility but it is surely and beyond any doubt a return from a highly developed to a simpler and more primitive stage of thought and government a system of government which consists of executive and people is probably the very first ever attempted by men among gregarious animals we find the herd and its leader and that was the first form of government among primitive men if we may trust the evidence of those tribes still extant in a low state of savagery who alone can give us an idea of the social and political condition of prehistoric man mr andrew lang in custom and myth to illustrate a very different subject says page two hundred and thirty seven even among those democratic paupers the fuegians the doctor wizard of each party has much influence over his companions among those other democrats the eskimo a class of wizards called the angakuts 
become a kind of civil magistrates because they can cause fine weather and can magically detect people who commit offences thus the germs of rank in these cases are sown by the magic which is fetishism in action try the zulus the heaven is the chief's he can call up the clouds and storms hence the sanction of his authority in new zealand every rongatira has a supernatural power if he touches an article no one else dares to approach it for fear of terrible supernatural consequences a head chief is tabooed an inch thick and perfectly unapproachable magical power abides in and emanates from him by this superstition an aristocracy is formed and property the property at least of the aristocracy is secured among the red indians as schoolcraft says priests and jugglers are the only persons that make war and have a voice in the sale of the land mr e w robertson says much the same thing about early scotland if odin is not a god with his gifts of a medicine man and did not owe his chieftainship to his talent for dealing with magic he is greatly maligned the irish brehans also sanctioned legal decisions by magical devices afterward condemned by the church among the Zulus, the Atonya, spirit, dwells with the great man. He who dreams is the chief of the village. The chief alone can read in the vessel of divination. The Kaneka chiefs are medicine men. The chiefs here described derive their authority from the popular belief in their magic powers, but the germ of government which is apparent is that of the people and executive out of these wizards and medicine men these chiefs protected by the taboo came the king as fraser shows in his early history of the kingship the machinery was constantly elaborated and perfected as the centuries passed and the king steadily absorbed more power as was inevitable but the system remained in essence the executive and the people on the other hand we may study experiments in direct democracy in athens and in rome more than two thousand years ago and at a later time in some of the medieval italian cities this examination will reveal the fact that representative government on a large scale is a modern development originating in england and also that while people began long ago to place limitations on the once unrestrained power of the king or the kingship it was in our constitution that a people for the first time put limitations upon themselves which has hitherto been considered an evidence of unusual intelligence and of high civilizations i have ventured upon this digression because it seems to me important to emphasize the fact that these efforts to get rid of representative government and the independence of the judiciary whether good or bad are not attempts to advance from what we now have but to revert to an earlier and more primitive forms of social and political organizations this point of reversion to earlier forms so far as it relates to the courts has never been more vividly and strongly stated than by mr roosevelt in an article upon the vice-presidential candidates which he contributed to the review of reviews in november eighteen ninety six page two hundred ninety five the men who object to what they style government by injunction are as regards the essential principles of government in hearty sympathy with their remote skin-clad ancestors who lived in caves fought one another with stone-headed axes and ate the mammoth and woolly rhinoceros they are interesting as representing a geological survival but they are dangerous whenever there is the least chance of their making the principles of this ages buried past living factors in our present life they are not in sympathy with men of good minds and sound civic morality furthermore the chicago convention attacked the supreme court again this represents a species of atavism that is of recurrence to the ways of thought of remote barbarian ancestors savages do not like an independent and upright judiciary they want the judge to decide their way and if he does not they want to behead him the populists experience much the same emotions when they realize that the judiciary stands between them and plunder 
let us now examine what lincoln said or wrote and try to determine whether he stood for the new or the old for self-limited or for direct and unlimited democracy with a special reference to the two points of government by representation and judicial independence on one most memorable occasion lincoln told the world what the government was for which the people whom he led were pouring out their treasure and offering up their lives i will not use my own words to describe what he then said but those of an impartial english historian one of them these beautiful cemeteries on the field of gettysburg will be near to anglo-saxons for all time because it inspired the famous two-minute speech which is perhaps the most perfect example in our language of what such a speech on such an occasion should be i will read to you the gettysburg speech thus characterized by sir spencer walpole only a portion relates to our subject but that speech cannot be read or repeated too often by americans and there never has been a time since the hour of its utterance when it should be more reverently and thoughtfully pondered by all who love their country than in these days now passing over us it was on the nineteenth of november eighteen sixty three a little more than four months after the great battle that lincoln spoke as follows in dedicating the national cemetery at gettysburg fourscore and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created free and equal now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure we are met on a great battlefield of that war we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as the final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this but in a larger sense we cannot dedicate we cannot consecrate we cannot hallow this ground the brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract the world will little note nor long remember what we say here but it can never forget what they did here it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain that this nation under god shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth the last sentence is the one which concerns us here what government did he refer to in those closing lines as the one for which the soldiers died and to the preservation of which he asked his countrymen to dedicate themselves it was the government of the united states it could have been no other his own title was president of the united states the uniform which the soldiers wore and the flag which they followed were the uniform and the flag of the united states of america he defined this government to which he gave his life as a government of the people by the people and for the people this famous definition familiar in our mouths as household words was applied to the government of the united states as created established and conducted by and under the constitution adopted in seventeen eighty nine with the exception of the three war amendments and that just adopted establishing the income tax it is the same constitution and the same government today that it was in november eighteen sixty three lincoln thought it a popular government he did not regard it as a government by a president or by a congress or by judges but as a government of by and for the people and in his usual fashion he stated his proposition so clearly and with such finality that there is no escape from his meaning we might well be contented to stop here and accepting lincoln's definition stand upon his broad assertion of the character of our government and look with suspicion upon those who in the name of the people seek to tear down that constitution which has given us what he declared to be in the fullest sense a government of the people 
but it is neither necessary nor desirable to stop with the gettysburg speech for it is important to learn if we can in more detail what lincoln thought of the limitations established by the constitution with especial reference to this principle of representation and the power of the courts very early in his career when he was not yet twenty-seven years of age he said in an address before the young men's lyceum at springfield illinois on january twenty seventh eighteen thirty seven we find ourselves under the government of a system of political institutions conducting more essentially to the ends of civil and religious liberty than any of which the history of the former times tells us theirs was the task and nobly they performed it to possess themselves and through themselves us of this goodly land and to uprear upon its hills and its valleys a political edifice of liberty and equal rights tis ours only to transmit these the former unprofaned by the foot of an invader the latter undecayed by the lapse of time and untorn by usurpation to the latest generation that fate shall permit the world to know at what point then is the approach to danger to be expected i answer if it ever reach us it must spring up among us it cannot come from abroad if destruction be our lot we must ourselves be its author and finisher as a nation of free men we must live through all time or die by suicide in these sentences we see at once that the great style of the gettysburg address and of the second inaugural is still undeveloped that the power of expression so remarkable in later years has not yet been found but the conviction as to the character of our government which attained its final form at gettysburg is here and in closing words warns us that destruction of our government can come only from ourselves demand our attention now as insistently as when they were uttered by an obscure young man in illinois looking far into the future only to be passed over unheeded by a careless world such then was lincoln's belief in the character of our government at the outset of life and such it continued to the end as i shall show later upon the two particular points which we now have under consideration he had owing to the circumstances of his time a good deal to say about the courts and very little in express form about representative government because nobody in his day questioned the representative system but representative government rests upon certain broad principles in regard to which lincoln spoke clearly and decisively the basic theory of representative government is that the representative body represents all the people and that a majority of that body represents a majority of all the people to the majority in congress the power of action is committed and so it is guarded as to exclude so far as human ingenuity can do it any opportunity for control of the government by an organized minority either among the voters or their representatives it is these very provisions for securing majority rule which have led to the development of such devices as the compulsory initiative and referendum in order that organized minorities may gain a power of control which they could not obtain under a purely representative government having thus established majority rule through the representative system the framers of the constitution with their deep-rooted distrust of uncontrolled power anywhere then proceeded to put limitations upon the power of the majority they were well aware that a majority of the voters at any given moment did not necessarily represent the enduring will of the people they knew equally well that in the end the real will of the people must be absolute but they desired that there should be room for deliberation and for second thought and that the rights of minorities and individuals should be so far as possible protected and secured hence the famous limitations of the constitution i need not rehearse them all the most vital are those embodied in the first ten amendments which constitute a bill of rights the rights of men or human rights and any violation of those rights is forbidden to congress and to the majority as further restraints upon the majority they gave the executive veto which raised the necessary majority for action to two-thirds while upon the courts they conferred by implication opportunity to declare in specific cases any law to be in violation of the principles laid down by the constitution 
End of Part 1, Section 8Section 9 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. Chapter 9. The Democracy of Abraham Lincoln. Part 2. Upon this first point of the limitation upon the majority, whether of voters or representatives, which is the essence of our constitutional system of representation, Lincoln spoke in a manner which cannot be misunderstood. He said in the first inaugural, If by the mere force of numbers a majority should deprive a minority of any clearly written constitutional right, it might, in a moral point of view, justify revolution certainly would if such a right were a vital one but such is not the case all the vital rights of minorities and of individuals are so plainly assured to them by affirmations and negations guarantees and prohibitions in the constitution that controversies never arise concerning them a majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations and always changing easily with deliberate change of popular opinions and sentiments is the only true sovereign of a free people nothing could be clearer than these sentences in lincoln's opinion the violation of a vital constitutional right was moral justification for revolution and the last sentence gives a definition of free and real popular government upon which it would be difficult indeed to improve i have just said that one of the checks placed upon the power of the majority was the opportunity which of necessity devolved upon the courts to declare when a specific case was brought before them their opinion that the law involved in the suit was in violation of the constitution it is this judicial power asserted by marshall which has led to the present movement to destroy the independence of the courts by subjecting the judges to the recall and their decisions to review at the ballot box on this point lincoln spoke often and with great elaboration he did so because the famous dred scott case was a very burning issue in the years immediately preceding the civil war if an opinion was ever delivered by a court which justified resistance to or an attack upon the judicial authority it was that one known by the name of a poor negro dred scott the opinion against which the conscience of men revolted did not decide the case it was an obiter dictum it was delivered solely for the purpose of settling a great political question by pronouncement from the supreme court there was no disguise as to what was intended Mr. Buchanan, informed as to what was coming after his arrival in Washington, announced in his inaugural that the question of slavery in the territories would soon be disposed of by the Supreme Court. The wise practice of the Supreme Court is to decline jurisdiction of political questions, holding that such questions belong solely to Congress and the executive in this case the court deliberately traveled outside the record in order to speak upon a purely political question which then divided the whole country for such action there is no defense born of the passions of the slavery contest the dred scott case stands in our history as a flagrant attempt by the supreme court to usurp power there has been nothing like it before or since the lesson of that gigantic blunder was learned thoroughly and will never be forgotten by the court at least the attack upon the dictum of the court began with the masterly dissenting opinion of mr justice curtis which wrecked tawney's argument both in the law and the facts from the courtroom the attack spread over the country and the utterances of the chief justice were assailed with all the bitterness characteristic of that period and defended with equal fervor by those who supported slavery and declared that a refusal to accept the decision was tantamount to treason lincoln as one of the leaders of the new republican party was obliged to deal with it he did so fully and thoroughly all that he said deserves careful study 
for there is no more admirable analysis of the powers of the court and of the attitude which should be taken in regard to them i shall make no excuse for quoting what he said at length and i may add that his utterances on this great question require neither explanation nor commentary from me or any one else i will begin however with a protest against a bill for the reorganization of the judiciary signed by lincoln as a member of the illinois legislature these resolutions which lincoln drafted show what his general views were as to the courts many years before the dred scott decision the important portion of them runs as follows for reasons thus presented and for others no less apparent the undersigned cannot assent to the passage of the bill or permit it to become law without this evidence of their disappropriation and they now protest against the reorganization of the judiciary because one it violates the great principles of free government by subjecting the judiciary to the legislature two it is a fatal blow at the independence of the judges and the constitutional term of their office three it is a measure not asked for or wished for by the people four it will greatly increase the expense of our courts or else greatly diminish their utility five it will give our courts a political and partisan character thereby impairing public confidence in their decision six it will impair our standing with other states and the world signed by thirty-five members among whom was abraham lincoln it will be observed that the first two objections state in the strongest terms the principle of the independence of the judiciary and declare that this great principle is violated by subjecting judiciary to the legislature who were the representatives of the people in this case it happened to be the legislature but the principle is that the court should not be subjected to any outside control or influence whether that control comes from the executive the legislature or the voters holding these principles lincoln sixteen years later was brought face to face with the dred scott opinion and this is how he dealt with it a little more than three months after it was delivered in a speech at springfield illinois on june twenty sixth eighteen fifty seven he senator douglas denounces all who question the correctness of that decision as offering violent resistance to it but who resists it who in spite of the decision declared dred scott free and resisted the authority of his master over him judicial decisions have two uses first to absolutely determine the case decided and secondly to indicate to the public how other similar cases will be decided when they arise for the latter use they are called precedents and authorities we believe as much as judge douglas perhaps more in obedience to and respect for the judicial department of government we think its decisions on constitutional questions when fully settled should control not only the particular cases decided but the general policy of the country subject to be disturbed only by amendments of the constitution as provided in that instrument itself more than this would be revolution but we think the dred scott decision is erroneous we know the court that made it has often overruled its own decisions and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this we offer no resistance to it judicial decisions are of greater or less authority as precedents according to circumstances that this should be so accords both with common sense and the customary understanding of the legal profession if this important decision had been made by the unanimous concurrence of the judges and without any apparent partisan bias and in accordance with legal public expectation and with the steady practice of the departments throughout our history and had been in no part based on assumed historical facts which are not really true or if wanting in some of these it had been before the court more than once and had there been affirmed or reaffirmed through a course of years then it might be perhaps would be factious nay even revolutionary not to acquiesce in it as a precedent but when as is true we find it wanting in all these claims to the public confidence it is not resistance 
it is not factious it is not even disrespectful to treat it as not having yet quite established a settled doctrine for the country contrast these calm words uttered under the greatest provocation with the violent attacks now made on the courts for two or three decisions which are in no respect political and which are as nothing compared to the momentous issue involved in the dred scott case where the freedom of human beings and the right of people to decide upon slavery in the territories were at stake there is not a proposition which is not stated with all lincoln's unrivalled lucidity and there is not the faintest suggestion of breaking down the power of the courts or of taking from them their independence a year later just before the great debate with douglas but when that debate had in reality begun lincoln at chicago on july tenth eighteen fifty eight again took up the dred scott case and spoke as follows i have expressed heretofore and i now repeat my opposition to the dred scott decision but i should be allowed to state the nature of that opposition and i ask your indulgence while i do so what is fairly implied by the term judge douglas has used resistance to the decision i do not resist it if i wanted to take dred scott from his master i would be interfering with property and that terrible difficulty that judge douglas speaks of of interfering with property would arise but i am doing no such thing as that all i am doing is refusing to obey it as a political rule if i were in congress and the vote should come up on a question of whether slavery should be prohibited in a new territory in spite of the dred scott decision i would vote that it should that is what i would do judge douglas said last night that before the decision he might advance his opinion and it might be contrary to the decision when it was made but after it was made he would abide by it until it was reversed just so we let this property abide by the decision but we will try to reverse that decision we will try to put it where judge douglas would not object for he says he will obey it until it is reversed somebody has to reverse that decision since it is made and we mean to reverse it and we mean to do it peaceably what are the uses of decisions of courts they have two uses as rules of property they have two uses first they decide upon the question before the court they decide in this case that dred scott is a slave nobody resists that not only that but they say to everybody else that persons standing just as dred scott stands are as he is that is they say that when a question comes up upon another person it will be so decided again unless the court decides in another way unless the court overrules its decision well we mean to do what we can to have the court decide the other way that is the one thing we mean to try to do again in a speech at springfield illinois on july seventeenth eighteen fifty eight he said now as to the dred scott decision for upon that he makes his last point at me he boldly takes ground in favor of that decision this is one half the onslaught and one third of the entire plan of the campaign i am opposed to that decision in a certain sense but not in the sense which he puts on it i say that in so far as it decided in favor of dred scott's master and against dred scott and his family i do not propose to disturb or resist the decision i never have proposed to do any such thing i think that in respect for judicial authority my humble history would not suffer in comparison with that of judge douglas he would have the citizens conform his vote to that decision the member of congress his the president his use of the veto power he would make it a rule of political action for the people and all the departments of government i would not by resisting it as a political rule i disturb no right of property create no disorder excite no mobs in some notes for speeches which the editors date october one eighteen fifty eight we find this fragment which is of great interest because it shows how strongly lincoln felt that the dred scott case could be dealt with and set aside under the constitution without amending that instrument or seeking to break down the independence of the court the note runs as follows 
that burlesque upon judicial decisions and slander and profanation upon the honored names and sacred history of republican america must be overruled and expunged from the books of authority to give the victory to the right not bloody bullets but peaceful ballots only are necessary thanks to our good old constitution the organization under it these alone are necessary it only needs that every right-thinking man shall go to the polls and without fear or prejudice vote as he thinks again in the joint debate at quincy illinois on october thirteenth eighteen fifty eight he said we do not propose that when dred scott has been decided to be a slave by the court we as a mob will decide him to be free we do not propose that when any other one or one thousand shall be decided by that court to be slaves we will in any violent way disturb the rights of property thus settled but we nevertheless do oppose that decision as a political rule which shall be binding on the voter to vote for nobody who thinks it is wrong which shall be binding on the members of congress or the president to favor no measure that does not actually concur with the principles of that decision we do not propose to be bound by it as a political rule in that way because we think it lays the foundation not merely of enlarging and spreading out what we consider an evil but it lays the foundations for, for spreading that evil into the states themselves we propose so resisting it as to have it revised if we can and a new judicial rule established upon this subject i will add this that if there be any man who does not believe that slavery is wrong in the three aspects which i have mentioned or in any one of them that man is misplaced and ought to leave us while on the other hand if there be any man in the republican party who is impatient over the necessity springing from its actual presence and is impatient of the constitutional guarantees thrown around it and would act in disregard of these he too is misplaced standing with us he will find his place somewhere else for we have a due regard so far as we are capable of understanding them for all these things this gentleman as well as i can give it is a plain statement of our principles in all their enormity he discussed the great question many times but i will make only one more quotation the passage in his first inaugural where on the eve of secession and civil war he gave expression every word weighed and meditated to his opinions and intentions on that solemn occasion he spoke thus of the courts i do not forget the position assumed by some that constitutional questions are to be decided by the supreme court nor do i deny that such decisions must be binding in any case upon the parties to a suit as to the object of that suit while they are also entitled to very high respect and consideration in all parallel cases by other departments of the government and while it is obviously possible that such decisions may be erroneous on any given case still the evil effect following it being limited to that particular case with the chance that it may be overruled and never become a precedent for other cases can be better borne than could the evils of a different practice at the same time the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the supreme court the instant they are made in ordinary litigation between the parties and personal actions the people will have ceased to be their own rulers having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of the eminent tribunal nor is there in this view any assault upon the courts or the judges it is a duty from which they may not shrink to decide cases properly brought before them and it is no fault of theirs if others seek to turn their decisions to political purposes from these extracts we may see that lincoln held the courts had no right to lay down a rule of political action and that if they did so no one was bound by it that now is indeed the position of the court itself he said that no one should resist the decision in the dred scott case but that it was the duty of all who believed that doctrine contrary to freedom and to american principles to seek to have it overruled 
not reviewed by the voters at the ballot box or changed by the recall of its authors but simply overruled by the court itself again no one will dissent but beyond this he did not go on the contrary he upheld the judicial authority within its proper domain and there is no suggestion to be found even under that bitter provocation of any attempt to make the court subservient to any outside power by any such device as recall still less is there any thought of reversing the decision by popular vote on the contrary at quincy we do not propose that when dred scott has been decided to be a slave by the court we as a mob will decide to make him free on the contrary at quincy we do not propose that when dred scott has been decided to be a slave by the court we as a mob will decide him to be free speaking to a popular audience he said as you remember there is no need to comment further upon the passages which have just been quoted it is enough for me to say that Lincoln's discussion of the Dred Scott case seems to me to contain the strongest arguments for an independent judiciary than can be found anywhere. We may also be sure, I think, that Lincoln did not forget in his righteous indignation at the Dred Scott opinion that every slave who set foot on English soil became a free man by Lord Mansfield's decision in the Somerset's case. 1772, or that slavery had been ended in Massachusetts by a decision of the Supreme Court of the State in 1783, under the sentence that all men are born free and equal, inserted into the Constitution of that state for that precise purpose by John Lowell. Passing now from the particular to the general, let me, by a few brief quotations, show you what Lincoln thought of our government under the Constitution as a whole. In a speech at Columbus, Ohio, on September 16, 1859, he said, I believe there is a genuine popular sovereignty. I think a definition of genuine popular sovereignty in the abstract would be about this that each man shall do precisely as he pleases with himself and with all those things which exclusively concern him applied to government this principle would be that a general government shall do all those things which pertain to it and that all local governments shall do precisely as they please in respect to those matters which exclusively concern them i understand that this government of the united states under which we live is based upon this principle and I am misunderstood if it is supposed that I have any war to make upon that principle. In his address at Cooper Institute in New York on February 27, 1860, he said, Now, now and here, let me guard a little against being misunderstood. I do not mean to say we are bound to follow implicitly in whatever our fathers did, to do so would be to discard all the lights of current experience, to reject all progress, all improvement. What I do say is that if we would supplant the opinions and policy of our fathers, in any case, we should do so upon evidence so conclusive and argument so clear that even their great authority, fairly considered and weighed, cannot stand and most surely not in a case whereof we ourselves declare they understood the question better than we. In his reply to the mayor of Philadelphia on February 21, 1861, he spoke as follows. Your worthy mayor has expressed the wish, in which I join with him, that it were convenient for me to remain in your city long enough to consult your merchants and manufacturers, or, as it were, to listen to those breathings rising within the consecrated walls, wherein the Constitution of the United States, and I will add, the Declaration of Independence, were originally framed and adopted. I assure you and your mayor that I had hoped on this occasion, and upon all occasions during my life, that I shall do nothing inconsistent with the teachings of these holy and most sacred walls. All my political warfare has been in favor of the teachings that came forth from these sacred walls. May my right hand forget its cunning, and my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if ever I prove false to these teachings. So he spoke at the threshold of the great conflict. 
listen to him now as he spoke three years later with the war nearing its close and when the hand of fate could almost be heard knocking at his door on august eighteenth eighteen sixty four in an address to the one hundred and sixty fourth ohio regiment he said we have as we all agree a free government where every man has a right to be equal with every other man in this great struggle this form of government and every form of human right is endangered if our enemies succeed there is more involved in this contest than is realized by every one there is involved in this struggle the question whether your children and my children shall enjoy the privileges we have enjoyed i say this in order to impress upon you if you are not already so impressed that no small matter should divert us from our great purpose there may be some inequalities in the practical application of our system it is fair that each man shall pay taxes in exact proportion to the value of his property but if we should wait before collecting a tax to adjust these taxes upon each man in exact proportion with every other man we should never collect any taxes at all there may be mistakes made sometimes things may be done wrong while the officers of the government do all they can to prevent mistakes but i beg of you as citizens of this great republic not to let your minds be carried off from the great work we have before us he said on august twenty two eighteen sixty four in his address to the one hundred and sixty sixth ohio regiment it is not merely for to-day but for all time to come that we should perpetuate for our children's children that great and free government which we have enjoyed all our lives i beg you to remember this not merely for my sake but for yours i happen temporarily to occupy this white house i am a living witness that any one of your children may look to come here as my father's child has it is in order that each one of you may have through this free government which we have enjoyed an open field and a fair chance for your industry enterprise and intelligence that you may all have equal privileges in the race of life with all its desirable human aspirations it is for this the struggle should be maintained that we may not lose our birthright not only for one but for two or three years the nation is worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable jewel and on august thirty one eighteen sixty four in an address to the one hundred and forty eighth ohio regiment he said but this government must be preserved in spite of the acts of any man or set of men it is worthy of your every effort nowhere in the world is presented a government of so much liberty and equality to the humblest and poorest among us are held out the highest privileges and positions the present moment finds me at the white house yet there is as good a chance for your children there as there was for my father's with these noble words uttered as the dark shadows of the past were fleeing away and the light of the coming victory was beginning to shine upon him let us leave him as at gettysburg over the graves of the dead soldiers he declared that the great battle had been fought in order that government of the people by the people for the people should not perish from the earth so now to the living soldiers he said that nowhere in the world was presented a government of so much liberty and equality thus at the close just as at the beginning when he was a young man entirely unknown beyond the confines of his village did he speak of the government of the united states under the constitution thus he described his conception of democracy and that conception he found fulfilled in the constitution of the united states and in the great principles of ordered freedom and guarded rights which are there embodied there is one other point alluded to by lincoln when he defined genuine popular government which does not directly concern the subject i have been discussing but which is of quite equal importance and upon which i wish to say a few words in closing the framers of the constitution made one great contribution to the science of government in the application of the principle of federation upon a scale and in a manner never before attempted a large part of the constitution is devoted to the arrangement and adjustment of the relations between the states and the general government upon the construction of those relations as we all know parties divided and our history largely turned for more than seventy years 
the contest was between the rights of the states on the one hand and the powers of the central government on the other the conflict culminated in a civil war and in the effort of certain states to break up the union the result of the war was the preservation of the union and the defeat of secession but secession or the separation of the states is not the only way in which the union can be destroyed the other and no less effective method of destroying the Union is by the abolition of the states, which could be attained by reducing them to merely nominal divisions and taking from them those powers and duties reserved to them by the Constitution and which alone make them living organisms. The first danger ended forever at Appomattox. The second is threatening us, and in no obscure fashion today. The growth of the power of the central government, together with its constant assumption of new duties, is in a degree inevitable, and in a less degree, no doubt, desirable. But this inevitable movement is always quite rapid enough, and should be retarded rather than accelerated. It is not, however, to this tendency of development that I now refer, but to something much graver, and which is in its nature absolutely destructive. There is a widespread agitation in favor of having presidents nominated as party candidates, not by the people of the states, each state being allotted the number of votes to which it is entitled by the number of party votes cast at a previous election, but by all the members of the party throughout the country without reference to state lines. It is further proposed, and a constitutional amendment with that objective in view was pending in the Senate at the last session, to have the president elected by the votes of all the people, instead of by the votes of the people of the states, each state having two votes as a state, and additional votes based on population. An amendment to that effect, proposed as an addition to another constitutional amendment, was defeated in the Senate a few weeks ago by a narrow majority. A president so nominated and elected would not be the president of the United States, but of the American Republic, or President of the Americans, as Louis Napoleon was styled Emperor of the French, having been chosen by a universal plebiscite. Party principles, party organization, party responsibility would all disappear. Perhaps in this connection it is not amiss to remember that in a eulogy upon Henry Clay, delivered in the State House at Springfield, Illinois, on July 16, 1852, Lincoln said, a free people in times of peace and quiet, when pressed by no common danger, naturally divide into parties. At such times the man who is of neither party is not, cannot be, of any consequence. Mr. Clay, therefore, was of a party. As usual, in discussing any subject, he laid his unerring finger upon a vital point. The destruction of parties and party organizations would reduce the unorganized voters, acting simply as individuals, to a condition of helplessness. We should no longer have great organizations with declared principles and established traditions, which could be held to strict responsibility, but simply followers of certain chiefs. Those chiefs would be self-made, presidential candidates with personal manifestos after the familiar fashion of south american dictators but these objections serious as they are sink into insignificance when compared with the far graver results which lie behind these propositions to nominate and elect presidents by a vote of the whole people without reference to state lines would be a step and a long step toward the extinction of the states that would mean the enormous exaltation of the executive power, to which all these movements for the destruction of the Constitution alike tend. The abolition or degradation of the states would mean a real imperialism, and not the sham imperialism, about which many excellent people were quite needlessly distressed when we took possession of certain islands after the Spanish War. We might continue to call our territorial division states and their chief executive officers governors but names are nothing and with the states stripped of all power they would be in reality provinces and their rulers prefects appointed in washington 
the abolition of the states would mean the loss or the ruin of great principle of local self-government which lies at the very root of free popular government and of true democracy the states within their limitations and in the exercise of their proper powers are the sheet anchor which keeps the ship of state from drifting helplessly upon the rocks of empire and of personal autocratic rule where so many great nations have met untimely wreck these are no imaginary dangers no alarms conjured up to arrest improvement and advance actual measures leading to the results i have described are being pressed and advocated it is a less obvious a slower more insidious way of destroying the union of states than by open war but if successful it is equally certain in its results we should pause long and think well before we enter upon such changes as these all the more perilous because they are demanded in the name of the people and look harmless perhaps to those who do not stop to consider them we are confronted today with the gravest questions which the american people have been called upon to decide since eighteen sixty i do not mean questions of social or economic policy nor issues of war or peace or foreign relations i mean questions now pressing upon us which involve the very fabric of our constitution under which freedom order and prosperity have gone with us hand in hand it is a time for careful thought a time to tear aside the veils of speech and come straight to the substance of things to facts and principles let us not at a time like this and in the presence of such questions be the slaves of words and phrases in the book of judges it is written and they said unto him say now shibboleth and he said sibboleth for he could not frame to pronounce it right then they took him and slew him at the passages of the jordan there has been too much of this of late too much dependence on how loudly a man would shout certain words and how he pronounced the shibboleth which was proposed to him let us get away from words and phrases and come down to facts and deeds before we begin to revolutionize our constitution and its principles let us know well what the constitution is what it means what it has accomplished and whither the changes so noisily urged will lead us in his message to congress on july fourth eighteen sixty one speaking of the officers of the regular army from the seceding states who had remained true to the government of the union lincoln said this is the patriotic instinct of the plain people they understand without an argument that the destroying of the government which was made by washington means no good to them i have faith that the people to-day feel as they did then i am sure that when they shall understand whither they are being led they will know that to impair or destroy the government which washington made and lincoln saved means no good to them End of section 9section 10 of the democracy of the constitution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by annie rue the democracy of the constitution and other addresses and essays by henry cabot lodge john c calhoun part 1 john c calhoun footnote speech on the acceptance of the statue of john c calhoun delivered in the senate of the united states march twelfth nineteen ten end of footnote mr president when the senior senator from south carolina mr tillman whose illness we all deplore did me the honor to ask me to take part in the ceremonies connected with the reception of the statue of mr calhoun i was very much gratified by his request in the years which preceded the civil war south carolina and massachusetts represented more strongly more extremely perhaps than any other states the opposing principles which were then in conflict now when that period has drifted back into the quiet waters of history it seems particularly appropriate that massachusetts should share the recognition which we give to-day to the memory of the great senator from south carolina 
if i may be pardoned a personal word it seems also fitting that i should have the privilege of speaking upon this occasion for my own family were friends and followers in successive generations of hamilton webster and sumner i was brought up in the doctrines and beliefs of the great federalist the great whig and the great republican it seems to me i repeat not unfitting that one so bred and taught should have the opportunity to speak here when we commemorate the distinguished statesman who during the last twenty-five years of his life represented with unrivalled ability those theories of government to which hamilton webster and sumner were all opposed from seventeen eighty seven to eighteen sixty five the real history of the united states is to be found in the struggle between the forces of separatism and those of nationalism other issues and other questions during that period rose and fell absorbed the attention of the country and passed out of sight but the conflict between the nationalist spirit and the separatist spirit never ceased there might be a lull in the battle public interest might turn as it frequently did to other questions but the deep-rooted underlying contest was always there and finally took possession of every passion and every thought until it culminated at last in the appeal to arms the development of the united states as a nation in contradistinction to the league of states falls naturally into four divisions the first is covered by the administrations of washington and adams when the government was founded by washington and organized by hamilton and when the broad lines of the policies by which its conduct was to be regulated were laid down when washington died the work of developing the national power passed into the hands of another great virginian john marshall who in the cool retirement of the supreme court for thirty years steadily and surely but almost unnoticed at the moment converted the constitution from an experiment in government tottering upon the edge of the precipice which had engulfed the confederation into a charter of a nation while he was engaged upon his work to which he brought not only the genius of the lawyer and the jurist but of the statesman as well another movement went on outside the courtroom which stimulated the national life to a degree only realized in after years when men began to study the history of the time by the revolution we had separated ourselves from england and established nominally our political independence but that political independence was only nominal the colonial spirit still prevailed during two hundred years of colonial life our fortunes had been determined by events in europe it was no mere metaphor which pitt employed when he said he would conquer america upon the plains of germany and the idea embodied in the words of the great commoner clung to us even after the adoption of the constitution for habits of thought impalpable as air are very slow to change the colonial spirit resisted washington's neutrality policy when the french revolution broke out and as the years passed was still strong enough to hamper all our movements and force us to drift helplessly upon the stormy seas of the napoleonic wars the result was that we were treated by france on one side and england on the other in a manner which fills an american's heart with indignation and with shame even to read of it a hundred years afterward and in those days of humiliation there arose a group of young men chiefly from the south and west who made up their minds that this condition was unbearable that they would assert the independence of the united states that they would secure to her due recognition among the nations and that rather than have the shameful conditions which then existed continue they would fight they did not much care with whom they fought but they intended to vindicate the right of the united states to live as a respected and self-respecting independent nation animated by this spirit they plunged the country into war with england they did not stop to make proper preparations their legislation was often as violent as it was ineffective the war was not a success on land and was redeemed only by the victory at new orleans and by the brilliant fighting of our little navy on the face of the treaty of ghent it did not appear that we had gained a single one of the points for which we went to war and yet the war party had really achieved a complete triumph 
through their determination to fight at any cost we were recognized at last as an independent nation and what was far more important we had forever destroyed the colonial idea that politics and the peace of the united states were to veer hither and thither at the bidding of every breeze which blew from europe such work would not have been done without a vigorous growth of the national spirit and the national power and the group of brilliant men who brought on the war were entirely conscious that in carrying out their policy they were stimulating the national the american spirit to which they appealed chief among the leaders of that group of young men who were responsible for the origin and the conduct of the war of eighteen twelve was john c calhoun as the war, with its influences and results, sank back into the past, domestic questions took possession of the field, and the conflict between the separatists and national forces, which had been temporarily obscured, forged again to the front, but under deeply altered conditions. When John Marshall died in 1835, his great work done, the cause which he had so long sustained had already entered upon its third period, the period of debate and the task which had fallen from the falling hands of the great chief justice was taken up in another field by daniel webster who for twenty years stood forth as a champion of the proposition not that the constitution could make a nation but that as a matter of fact it had made a nation against him was calhoun and between the two was henry clay the twenty years of debate which then ensued are known familiarly as the days of clay webster and calhoun the names of the presidents who occupied the white house during most of that time have faded and the era of debate in the history of the parliamentary struggle between the national and the separatist principles is not associated with them but with the great senators who made it illustrious as the century passed its zenith all three died closely associated in death as they had been in life the compromise which clay and webster defended and of which calhoun despaired was quickly wrecked in the years which followed and then came war and the completion of the work begun by washington through the life and death of abraham lincoln and the sacrifices and the tragedy of four years of civil war to have been as calhoun was for forty years a chief figure in that period of conflict and development first a leader among able men who asserted the reality of the national independence and established the place of the united states among the nations of the earth and afterward the undisputed chief of those who barred the path of national movement implies a man of remarkable powers both of mind and character he merits not only the serious consideration which history accords but deserves also that we should honor his memory here and turning aside from affairs of the moment should recall him and his work in order that we may understand what he was and what he meant he was pre-eminently a strong man and strong men leaders of mankind who shape public thought and decide public action are very apt to exhibit in high degree the qualities of the race from which they spring calhoun came of a vigorous race and displayed the attributes both moral and intellectual which marked it with unusual vividness and force on both sides he was of scotch descent his name is a variant of the distinguished scotch name calhoun it was a place name assumed at the beginning of the thirteenth century when they came into possession of certain lands by the noble family which was destined to bear it for many generations judged by the history of the knights who in long succession held the estates and the title the cahoons or calhouns who spread and multiplied until they became a clan were very strong very able very tenacious stock they had great need of all these qualities in order to maintain themselves in power property and position during the five hundred years which elapsed before the first calhoun and the first caldwell started on the migration which after a brief pause in the north of ireland carried patrick calhoun and some of the caldwells over the ocean to south carolina both families were typical of their race for the calhouns are spoken of as a gaelic clan while the caldwells were lowlanders from solway in order to understand these types we must go back for a moment into those dim almost uncharted regions of history where the tribes of the germanic forests may be discerned pouring upon the wreck of the roman empire 
when the successive waves of teutonic invasion broke upon britain they swept up to the mountains of the north driving the native picts and scots before them and no part of their conquest was more thoroughly danish and saxon than the lowlands of scotland but the highlander who represented the survival of the celts and the lowlander who represented the invaders were quickly welded together in a common hostility to their great and grasping neighbor of the south the celtic blood mingled with that of the descendants of the teutonic tribes they quarrelled they fought side by side they intermarried they modified each other and gradually adopted each other's customs and habits of thought we have but to read rob roy to learn that although the highlander looked down upon the lowlander as a trader and shopkeeper and the lowlander regarded the highlander as wild and barbarous the ties of blood and common suffering were strong between them and that they all were scotchmen it is a remarkable history that of scotland one of the most remarkable in the annals of men shut up in that narrow region of mountain and of lake a land of storm and cold mist with no natural resources except a meagre soil and a tempestuous sea to yield a hard-earned living poor in this world's goods few in number for six hundred years these hardy people maintained their independence against their powerful foe to the southward and only united with him at last upon equal terms for six hundred years they kept their place among the nations were allies of france were distinguished for their military virtues on the continent of europe and cherished as a pride of race and country to which their deeds gave them an unclouded title they did all these things these little people by hard fighting for six hundred years they fought sometimes in armies sometimes in bands always along the border frequently among themselves it was a terrible training it did not tend to promote the amenities of life but it gave slight chance of survival to the timid or the weak it produced the men who fell with their kings at flodden they could die there where they stood beneath the royal standard but they could not be conquered those six centuries of bitter struggle for life and independence raged continuously against nature and man not only made the scotch formidable in battle and renowned in every camp in europe but they developed qualities of mind and character which became inseparable from the race for it was not merely by changing blows that the scotch maintained their national existence under the stress of all these centuries of trial they learned to be patient and persistent with a fixity of purpose which never weakened a tenacity which never slackened and a determination which never wavered the scotch intellect passing through the same severe ordeal as it was quickened tempered and sharpened so it acquired a certain restlessness in reasoning which it never lost it emerged at last complete vigorous acute and penetrating with all these strong qualities of mind and character was joined an intensity of conviction which burned beneath the cool and calculating manner and of which the stern and unmoved exterior gave no sign like the fire of a furnace rarely flaming but sending forth a fierce and lasting heat to this somewhat rare combination we owe the proverbial phrase of the preferidium ignium scotorum an attribute little to be expected in a people so outwardly calm and self-contained to them in the struggle of life could be applied the words which macaulay described cromwell's army they marched to victory with the precision of machines while burning with the wildest fanaticism of crusaders after the union under queen anne peace came gradually to the long distracted land broken only by the jacobite risings of seventeen fifteen and seventeen forty five and then the scotch intellect found its opportunity and began to flower in the latter part of the eighteenth and first part of the nineteenth century scotland gave to poetry scott and burns and campbell to history hume and robertson to metaphysics hamilton reed and stuart to fiction smollett and the author of waverley to political economy adam smith and these are only the greatest luminaries in the firmament of stars edinburgh became one of the most intellectual centres of western civilization and the genius of scotland was made famous in every field of thought and imagination it was just at this time that john caldwell calhoun came upon the stage 
for the scotch intellect trained and disciplined through the darkness and conflicts of six hundred years blossomed in the new world as in the old when once the long pressure was removed when the sword needed no longer be kept always unsheathed and men could sleep without the haunting fear that they might be awakened at any moment by the light burning homesteads and the hoarse shouts of raiders from over the border whose path was ever marked by desolation and bloodshed in the inadequate description which i have attempted of the scotch character and intellect slowly forged and welded and shaped by many stern hard-fighting generations i think i have set forth the mental and moral qualities of mr calhoun he had an intellect and a great strength a keen and penetrating mind he thought deeply and thought clearly he was relentless in reasoning and logic he never retreated from a conclusion to which his reasoning led and with all this he had the characteristic quality of his race the perifidium igneum the intensity of conviction which burned undimmed until his heart ceased to beat end of section ten Section 11 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. John C. Calhoun. Part 2 thus endowed by nature and equipped with as good an education as could then be obtained in the united states mr calhoun entered public life at the moment when the american people were smarting under the insults and humiliations heaped upon them by france and england and were groping about for some issue from their troubles and some vindication of the national honor and independence calhoun and his friends men like henry clay and like laundes and chevez from his own state came in on the wave of popular revolt against the conditions to which the country had been brought wavering diplomacy gunboats on wheels and even embargoes which chiefly punished our own commerce had ceased to appeal to them they had the great advantage of knowing what they meant to do they were determined to resist if necessary they intended to fight they dragged their party their reluctant president and their divided country helplessly after them the result was the war of eighteen twelve with war came not only the appeal to the national spirit which was only just waking into life but the measures without which war cannot be carried on the party which had opposed military and naval forces public debts tariffs banks and a strong central government now found themselves raising armies equipping and building a navy borrowing money imposing high import duties sustaining the bank and developing in all directions the powers of the government of the united states the doctrines of strict construction which had been the idols of the ruling party looked far less attractive when invoked by new england against their own policies and the constitution which jefferson set aside as he thought to acquire louisiana became most elastic in the hands of those who had sought to draw its band so tightly that the infant nation could hardly move its limbs mr calhoun with his mind set on the accomplishments of the great purpose of freeing the united states from foreign aggression and thus lifting it to its rightful place among the nations of the earth did not shrink from the conclusions to which his purpose led his mind was too clear and too rigidly logical to palter with or seek to veil the inevitable results of the policy he supported as he wished the end he was too virile too honest in his mental processes not to wish the means to that end the war left a legacy of debts and bankruptcy and in dealing with these problems it was calhoun who reported the bill for a new bank of the united states who sustained the tariff of eighteen sixteen defended the policy of protection to manufacturers and advocated a comprehensive scheme of internal improvements then it was that he declared in the house on the thirty first of january eighteen sixteen when he reported the bill setting aside certain funds for internal improvements after urging an increase of the army that 
as to the species of preparation the navy most certainly at any point of view occupies the first place it is the most safe most effectual and cheapest mode of defence in eighteen fourteen annals of congress page one thousand nine hundred sixty five he said in regard to manufactures that he hoped at all times and under every policy they would be protected with due care two years later he returned to the subject as part of his theory of the national defence and said in regard to the question of how far manufactures ought to be fostered it is the duty of this country as a means of defence to encourage its domestic industry more especially that part of it which provides the necessary materials for clothing and defence the question relating to manufactures must not depend on the abstract principle that industry left to pursue its own course will find in its own interests all the encouragement that is necessary laying the claims of manufacturers entirely out of view on general principles without regard to their interests a certain encouragement should be extended at least to our woolen and cotton manufacturers at the close of the same year december sixteen eighteen sixteen annals of congress eighteen sixteen through seventeen pages eight hundred and fifty three eight hundred and fifty four he said let it not be forgotten let it be for ever kept in mind that the extent of our republic exposes to us the greatest of all calamities next to the loss of liberty and even to that in its consequence disunion we are great and rapidly i was about to say fearfully growing this is our pride and danger our weakness and our strength little does he deserve to be entrusted with the liberties of his people who does not raise his mind to these truths we are under the most imperious obligation to counteract every tendency to disunion if we permit a low sordid selfish and sectional spirit to take possession of this house this happy scene will vanish we will divide and in its consequence will follow misery and despotism a little more than a month later broadening his theme to which he constantly recurred and speaking of internal improvements february fourth eighteen seventeen he said it is mainly urged that congress can only apply the money in execution of the enumerated powers i am no advocate for refined arguments on the constitution the instrument was not intended as a thesis for the logician to exercise his ingenuity on it ought to be construed with good plain sense and what can be more expressed than the constitution on this point if the framers had intended to limit the use of money to the powers afterward enumerated and defined nothing could have been more easy than to have expressed it plainly but suppose the constitution to be silent why should we be confined in the application of monies to the enumerated powers there is nothing in the reason of the thing that i can perceive why it should be so restricted and the habitual and uniform practice of the government coincides with my opinion in reply to this uniform course of legislation i expect it will be said that our constitution is founded on positive and written principles and not on precedents i do not deny the position but i have introduced these instances to prove the uniform sense of congress and the country for they have not been objected to as our powers and surely they furnish better evidence of the true interpretation of the constitution than the most refined and subtle arguments let us not be argued that the construction for which i contend gives a dangerous extent to the powers of congress in this point of view i conceive it to be more safe than the opposite by giving a reasonable extent to the money power it exempts us from the necessity of giving strained and forced construction to the other enumerated powers from the house of representatives he passed to the cabinet of president monroe where he served from eighteen seventeen to eighteen twenty five as secretary of war showing high capacity as an administrator he took the department avowedly as a reformer for the lesson of our unreadiness and our lack of military preparation had been burned into his mind by the bitter experiences of the war of eighteen twelve the army was reduced by congress during its tenure of office but organization discipline and efficiency were all advanced by his well-directed efforts in eighteen twenty five mr calhoun was elected vice-president and was re-elected four years later in eighteen thirty two he resigned the vice-presidency to become senator from south carolina 
his resignation followed by his acceptance of the senatorship marks his public separation from the policies of his earlier years and the formal devotion of his life to the cause of states rights and slavery the real division had begun some years before he left the vice presidency his change of attitude culminated in his support of nullification and his bitter quarrel with jackson which was all the more violent because they were of the same race and were both possessed of equal strength of will and equal intensity of conviction i have thus referred to the change in mr calhoun's position solely because of its historical significance marking as it does the beginning of a new epoch in the great conflict between the contending principles of nationalism and separatism in his own day he was accused of inconsistency and the charge was urged and repelled with the heat usual to such disputes nothing as a rule is more futile or more utterly unimportant than the efforts to prove inconsistency it is a favorite resort in debate and may therefore be supposed that it is considered effective in impressing the popular mind historically it is a charge which has little weight unless conditions lend it an importance which is never inherent in the mere fact itself if no man ever changed his opinions if no one was open to the teachings of experience human progress would be arrested and the world would stagnate in an intellectual lethargy inconsistency emerson has declared to be the bugbear of weak minds and this is entirely true of those who dreading the accusation shrink from adopting an opinion or a faith which they believe to be true but to which they have formerly been opposed mr calhoun defined inconsistency long before the day when the charge was brought against him with that fine precision of thought which was so characteristic of his utterances he said in the house in eighteen fourteen men cannot go straight forward but must regard the obstacles which impede their course inconsistency consists in a change of conduct when there is no change of circumstances which justify it tried by this accurate standard mr calhoun is as little to be criticized for his change of position as mr webster for his altered attitude in regard to the system of protection with the new conditions and new circumstances both men changed on important questions of policy and both were justified from their respective points of view in doing so that mr calhoun went further than mr webster changing not only as to a policy but in his views of the constitution and the structure of government does not in the least affect the truth of the general proposition the very measures which he had once fostered and defended had brought into being a situation which he felt with unerring prescience portended the destruction of the fundamental principles in which he believed and of a social and economic system which he thought vital to the safety and prosperity of the people whom he represented the national force which he had helped to strengthen the central government which he had so powerfully aided to build up seemed to him to have become like the creation of a frankenstein a monster which threatened to destroy its creators and all he personally held most dear it was inevitable that he should strive with all his strength to stay the progress of what he thought would bring ruin to the system in which he believed once committed to this opinion he was incapable of finding a halfway house where he could rest in peace or a compromise which he could accept with confidence his reason carried him to the inevitable end which his inexorable logic demanded and to that reason and that logic he was loyal with all the loyalty of strong conviction and an honest mind there is no need to discuss either the soundness or the validity of the opinions he held that is a question which has long since passed before the tribunal of history all that concerns us to-day is to recall the manner in which calhoun carried on his long struggle of twenty-five years in behalf of the principles to which he was utterly devoted he brought to the conflict remarkable mental and moral qualities deep conviction an iron will a powerful mind an unsparing logic and reasoning powers of the highest order burr said that any one who went on to paper with alexander hamilton was lost any one who admitted mr calhoun's premises was lost in like fashion once caught in the grasp of that penetrating and relentless intellect there was no escape <laughs> 
you must go with it to the end he fought his fight with unbending courage asking no quarter and giving none he flinched from no conclusion he faced every result without change or concession he had no fear of the opponents who met him in debate he felt assured in his own heart that he could hold his own against all comers but he must have known for he was not a man who ever suffered from self-deception that the enemies whom he could not overcome were beyond the range of argument and debate the unconquerable foes were the powerful and silent forces of the time which the great uprising of eighteen forty eight in behalf of political liberty was but a manifestation the world of civilized men was demanding a larger freedom and slavery economically sound was a survival and an anachronism even more formidable was the movement for national unity which was world-wide it was stirring in germany and was in active life in italy the principle of separatism particularism was at war with the spirit of the time the stars in their courses fought against sisera and calhoun with his keen perceptions must have known in his heart that he was defending his cause against hopeless odds but he never blenched and his gallant spirit never failed or yielded when the crisis of eighteen fifty came clay brought forward his last and most famous compromise which was supported by webster the two whig leaders were filled with dread as they contemplated the perils which at that moment menaced the union and were ready to go far in the road to concession calhoun then nearing his death had no faith in the compromise he saw with that clearness of vision which nothing could dim that in the existing state of public thought the presence of the aspirations for freedom and national unity which then filled the minds of men throughout the western civilization no compromise such as clay proposed could possibly endure he had his own plan which he left as a legacy to his country but his proposition was no compromise it settled the question it divided the country under the forms of law made the national government only a government in name the solution was complete but it was impossible clay's compromise as everyone knows was adopted there was a brief lull and the mighty forces of the age swept it aside and pressed forward in their inevitable conflict i think calhoun understood all this which is so plain now and was so hidden then better than either of his great opponents if they realized the situation as he did they at all events did not admit it clay with the sanguine courage which always characterized him with the invincible hopefulness which never deserted him gave his last years to his supreme effort to turn aside the menace of the time by a measure of mutual concession webster sustained clay but with far less buoyancy of spirit or of hope thus just sixty years ago they all stood together for the last time these three men who gave their names to an epoch in our history and who typified in themselves the tendencies of the time before two years more had passed they had all three gone and the curtain had fallen on the act of the great drama in which they had played the leading parts it is a moment in our history which has always seemed to me to possess an irresistible attraction not merely are the printed records the speeches that were then made and the memoirs then written of absorbing interest but the men themselves not only filled but looked their parts which is far from common in the case of actors and the never-ending drama of humanity they all looked in their portraits as imagination tells us they should look and i share the faith of carlyle in the evidence of portraiture over the rigorous angular and far from handsome features of henry clay is spread that air of serenity and cheerfulness which was among one of the many qualities which so drew him to the fervent affection of thousands of men we can realize as we study his portrait the fascination which attracted people to him the charm which enabled him as one of his admirers said to cast off his friends as huntsmen from his pack for he knew when he pleased he could whistle them back a gallant soul an inspiring leader a dashing winning impulsive nature brilliant talents i think one can see them all there in the face of henry clay turn to the latest portraits of webster and calhoun and you pass into another world
they are two of the most remarkable heads two of the most striking most compelling faces in the long annals of portraiture they are widely different so far as the outer semblance is concerned the great leonine head of webster charged with physical and mental strength the massive jaw the eyes as carlyle said glowing like dull anthracite furnaces beneath the heavy brows seemed at first glance to have no even remote resemblance to the haggard face of calhoun with dark piercing yet sombre eyes looking out from cavernous orbits the high intellectual forehead the stern strong mouth and jaw all printed deep with the lines of suffering endured in silence but if we look again and consider more deeply we can see that there is a likeness between them the last photographs of webster the last portraits of calhoun show us a certain strong resemblance which is not i think the mere creation of fancy bred by our knowledge of the time both are exceptionally powerful faces in both great intellect great force and the pride of thought are apparent and both are deeply tragic in their expression it is not the tragedy of disappointment because they had failed to attain the office which was the goal of their ambition that was the shallow explanation of excited contemporary judgment personal disappointment does not and cannot leave the expression we find on those two faces there is a listening fear in their regard not a personal fear they were too great for that but a dread because they heard as other men could not hear the hand of fate knocking at the door the shadow of the coming woe fell darkly across their last years and the tragedy which weighed them down was the tragedy of their country it was thus that webster looked when on the seventh of march speech in the great passage on peaceable secession he cried out in agony of spirit what states are to secede what is to remain american what am i to be an american no longer am i to be a sectional man a local man a separatist with no country in common with the gentlemen who sit around me here or who fill the other house of congress heaven forbid where is the flag of the republic to remain where is the eagle still to tower or is he to cower and shriek fall to the ground however webster and calhoun disagreed they both knew that the union could not be lightly broken they knew the disruption of the states would be a convulsion they foresaw that it would bring war the war which webster predicted and they both turned with dread from the vision which haunted them we catch the same note in the words of calhoun on march five eighteen fifty when he declared if i am judged by my acts i trust i shall be judged as firm a friend of the union as any man within it despite all he had said and done he still clung to the union he had served so long and when as the month closed he lay on his deathbed and thought of the future dark with menace was still with him and he was heard to murmur the south the poor south god knows what will become of her so they passed away the three great senators and the vast silent forces which moved mankind and settled the fate of nations marched forward to their predestined end we do well to place here a statue of calhoun i would that he would stand with none but his peers about him and not be elbowed and crowded by the temporarily notorious and the illustrious obscure the statue is here of right he was really a great man one of the conspicuous figures of our history in that history he stands out clear distinct commanding there is no trace of the demagogue about him he was a bold as well as a deep thinker and he had the full courage of his convictions the doctrines of socialism were as alien to him as the worship of commercialism he raised his mind to truths he believed that statesmanship must move on a high plane and he could not conceive that mere money-making and money-spending were the highest objects of ambition in the lives of men or nations he was the greatest man south carolina has given to the nation that in itself is no slight praise for from the days of the lawrences the pickneys the rutledges from the time of moultrie and sumter and marion to the present day south carolina has always been conspicuous in peace and war for the force the ability and the character of the men who have served her and given to her name high distinction in our history but calhoun was much more even than this he was one of the most remarkable men one of the keenest minds that american public life can show it matters not that before the last tribunal the verdict went against him 
that the extreme doctrines to which his imperious logic carried him have been banned and barred the man remains greatly placed in our history the unyielding courage the splendid intellect the long devotion to the public service the pure unspotted private life are all there are all here with us now untouched and unimpaired for ages to admire end of section eleven